Well, we are so back here at Nightly Offensive. I'm back in my studio, and uh, I'm so happy to be here because uh, there's a crazy war that has broken out around the country, insanity uh, around the United States over this Israel-Hamas conflict, and uh, it looks like it's already breaking apart the right wing. I'd like to welcome to uh, Nightly Offensive for the first time, my guest is uh, Chase Geyser. He is the host of the morning show right now on InfoWars and an InfoWars creator. Chase, welcome to the show for the first time. Honor and a pleasure to be with you. I've been following you for some time and a real fan of your work. Dude, well, that's good to hear, man. And I'm really happy to have you a fan of your work as well. Um, you know, the world has basically gone batshit crazy. And I want to bring up something absolutely crazy because, uh, you know, there was an ad going around today. And no matter what you do, everybody's an anti-Semite. You're an anti-Semite. We're all anti-Semites. Uh, even if you're Jewish, you're an anti-Semite, as long as you uh, don't agree with the current thing. Now, this video came up today, and it basically started a cascade of events that proves that uh, perhaps you're not crazy everyone else's. Here's what people think is actually going on in the world. Listen to this. I saw what you've been posting. Hitler was right. <laughs> I didn't teach you that. <laughs> you hide behind your screen spewing all this hatred and ugliness. You got something you want to say? Get out of the truck and say it to their faces. All right, Chase, let's just jump into this and talk here because the controversy uh, rang. I mean, it, it, people are so upset about what's going on. They're saying anti-Semitism uh, is on the rise. Um, the whole world is upset because people hate Jews. But as two white guys, I don't know if you're Jewish. Maybe you are. You can be Jewish. You cannot. It doesn't matter to me. It seems like people are shocked after spending the last two decades trying to flood our countries with people who hate us, breaking down the systemic structure of our countries, denying patriotism, removing Christianity, any semblance of unity, that all of a sudden that maybe people are discontent, maybe people are not happy, and perhaps because you taught people to hate white people, maybe, just maybe, they're not going to like Jews as well. I'm not shocked, man, but let's just jump right into this. What the hell is going on with this sudden shock that the world is hateful and that people don't like people. Well, I think we really saw it at the beginning of the Biden administration with that speech he's famous for, where he sort of called everyone domestic terrorists. He said that the greatest threat to national security was domestic terrorism, specifically right wing extremism or white supremacism. And there's constantly been this narrative on the rise of anti Semitism, particularly over the last two years. We even saw it after Musk purchased Twitter and turned it into X.com where we had this narrative that anti-Semitism was on the rise, hate speech was on the rise on his platform. And famously, he responded in an interview, what hate speech? And there was never a specific answer by anyone who's ever asked him about this. They don't actually have specific answers. They just make, make these broad stroke accusations. And I actually have a very controversial sort of conspiratorial theory on what's going on here. I think what happened was the Biden administration came in and I think that they knew this attack was gonna happen on October 7th from Hamas in Israel. I think that it was planned and funded. I think it's the reason the weapons were left behind in Afghanistan because they knew Iran was going to acquire them and give them to Hamas. And it's used as an excuse to get international support for Israel to annex Gaza and eventually the West Bank because they want to stabilize Israel in order to get the IMEC corridor built, which is going to go through the port of Haifa and compete with China's Belt and Road Initiative in an effort to protect the dollar as the global reserve currency. So that's in like one sort of like, you know, long sentence. What I think is actually going on here, I think the whole anti-Semitism narrative we've been hearing the last two years has been psychological preparation on the people to get support for Israel in the event of this conflict. Yeah, well, I think they're freaking out because I think that they thought they would have more uh, public support or mm -hmm. it could be that they didn't know. And that's why they're moving now, because they have, what, maybe 10, 15 years till the boomers lose control, uh, till evangelical Christians don't really have the same power struggle like Nikki Haley has. 
But it's crazy because I'm not the only person who thinks this way. I want to bring this up, right? In response to that video, uh, a man named the artist formerly known as Eric or Breaking Bat said, okay, well, the Jewish communities have been pushing the exact kind of dialectical hatred against whites that they claim to want people to stop using against them. I'm deeply disinterested in giving the tiniest shit now about Western Jewish populations coming to the disturbing realization that those hordes of minorities that support flooding their country don't exactly like them too much. You want the truth said to your face? There it is. And well, that, that is pretty true, right? That's my point is Jewish people have traditionally supported immigration for every country except for their own. And when you point something like that out, they go, well, you're, you know, you're anti-Semitic. One of the most famous videos I've ever seen in my life was, do you know, this is not even a joke. The only time that a Jewish activist group has been able to get over 100 rabbis around the country to agree on a political action, it was to increase uh, refugees coming into Western countries. This is a truthful statement. The only thing the rabbis could agree with. So, you know, you would think Jewish people would be happy about living next to Palestinians. You think they would be happy about them coming over their border. Why should we care about violence in their country? Why They don't care about violence on our southern border. Now, why this is controversial is not because it's just true. It's also because Elon Musk weighed in and said, you have said the actual truth. And everybody's like, oh, damn it. This is so anti-Semitic. He hates Jewish people. And it's like, dude, for one second, just shut the fuck up and stop calling everybody names and think for like five seconds if maybe he says it's the truth because it's the truth. And that is an absolute undeniable fact that universities, colleges, uh, Jewish associations, these groups support policies in the U.S. that they do not support in Israel that are destroying our countries. And so we don't have a lot of sympathy in our nations on the right wing anymore because it's like, well, fuck you guys because you guys are hypocrites. It's not because I hate them. It's not because I don't like them. It's because I think that they're a bunch of hypocrites who are destroying our countries and then pretending like Ben Shapiro, if you look it up, he never talks about America first. He's never so spoken it on Twitter, but has thousands of posts defending Israel. The, the, the mask is off now, and I don't hate Israel at all. Maybe people do, but I don't. I'm not even against Israel, but I'm not going to support a country and people who don't support me and are seeking the destruction of my own people in my country. I'm not for that shit. Call it whatever you want. Am I wrong on that? No, I think you're right, and I think it's important to distinguish Zionists from Jewish people. Obviously, the likes of Ben Shapiro will say that if you don't support Israel, it means that you're inherently anti-Semitic, but that's just simply not true. There are people who aren't Jewish who are Zionists. There are people who obviously are Jewish who are Zionists, and there are people who are Jewish who are not Zionists. So there's a difference between just sort of supporting Israel brazenly, like it has the infallibility of the Pope or something, and and being anti-Semitic. I think you know Hitler would be an example of somebody who's anti-Semitic. This is somebody who thought Jewish people were inherently inferior because of their Jewishness, as opposed to today, what's being framed as anti-Semitism is anybody who just would put America first instead of Israel, or who, or who would claim that Israel isn't always infallible. And Israel, like any other nation, is it's a government, which is a monopoly on power, and every government is subject to the same ails or sins that an individual human being is. And so we can't act like any nation or any government is this infall infallible entity. In, in my opinion, that's just a version of idol worship. Yeah. And I mean, and I'm with you on that. I think what's crazy though, is we're going to get into this Candace stuff because I think what, why I'm getting sick of this. And I think everybody does is like, dude, I don't care if you call me a Nazi anymore. I don't yeah, care amazing. if you, if you call me anti-Semitic, like we actually don't care. In fact, it just reminds me that you're probably retarded if you're using those words, unless you have a direct evidence to back it up. And the reason why I say this, it's proved that the reason why we, these people don't have support from a lot of us on the right wing anymore, even though we know many Jewish people, even though, you know, if Israel wants to fight with Arabs, if Jews and Arabs want to fight, they've been fighting for thousands of years, let them have at it. Um, you know, I think that uh, it's really important to, to demarcate that even if you're an evangelical Christian, that when God said that when he was going to bring back the Jews or he was going to allow them to return back in, in, in the last days, which is you know, what they believe is happening now. And maybe that is what's happening now that it was not going to be because they repented. It was going to, their hearts were still hardened and far from God. Like it was after the time of Jesus, but they were going to return to be used by God, but it never said that they repented and that they were close to God 
and that they were doing, they were intentionally doing good in the world. It just said that God was going to use them for his will, right? God used the death of Jesus Christ. You know, I wouldn't say it's good to, to, to crucify God. I don't think those people were good people that crucified God, but I think God used their wickedness and their evil to sure. accomplish his will on the earth. So if the Israel, to me, from what I read in the Bible, it's a wicked, evil country. Um, and that doesn't mean I hate Jewish people, just like I think the Biden administration is wicked and evil. And I think overall the United States is being used as a force for evil in foreign affairs right now. But I'm not anti-American and I'm not not a patriot. I just I'm accurate about my assessment on what's going on in the world. Um, and the reason why I know the anti-Semitism thing is a lot of a lot of shit. Right? I'm not going to hold back anymore. I'm just done. I'm just done holding back. We're gonna we're gonna be real here. Is you know when Candace Owen shared this this uh, post, and she said, "Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye." When men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil thing against you falsely for my sake, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And of course, talking about peace, calling for peace, and telling people not to serve God and money. Who got mad at this? Uh, good old Ben Shapiro said, Candace, if you feel that taking money from the daily wire somehow comes between you and God all by all means quit. This comes at the tail end of a large discussion as Candace has been one of the most vocal individuals calling for a ceasefire and calling against any indiscriminate bombing. But Chase, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts here um, You know, as we jump into this, this, this giant war. I mean, this gets really big. If you're tracking this, remember this is an audio-only podcast. You can download it in the comments below. But this brings up a bigger split right now um, and it's not just about people say, what is this about? I'm not talking about whether we should support Hamas or Israel. It's why are, are why are the people that we give money to? Why are the organizations, the speakers, the commentators more concerned about foreign countries well-being or whether you do or don't support them than they are about their own country? This is about America first or America last, not about whether you're an anti-Semite or, or a Zionist. You know what I mean? This is what you mm -hmm. care about. Why do you think Ben Shapiro would insert himself into this conversation attack one of his employees openly, and then also get mad about the Bible, right? The New Testament, you're getting mad about the Bible, showing that he's not really in support of Christians expressing their faith when it goes against his views politically. Yeah, that's a really good question. And there's a couple of different angles on this. The first thing that comes to mind is obviously Ben Shapiro is an Israel first guy. And I think if you were to ask him explicitly whether he's Israel first or America first, I think he would probably honestly respond and say that because of his religion, and his devotion to God, his interpretation certainly of God, that he would probably admit that he's an Israel first person. However, I've got a little bit of a controversial take on why this is going down. And I'll tell you exactly what it is, but I just wanna disclaim and say that I'm not just saying this to be a dick. Okay, this is just my analysis. I watched the Candace show as soon as she switched over to Daily Wire, I watched the first couple episodes. I think the likes of Jocko Willink were on, Robbie Starbucks, a friend of mine, he was on, somebody that's been on my podcast as well. And over time, what we've seen is they shifted away from a live studio audience from that show. I see Michael Knowles, Matt Walsh, and Ben Shapiro clips go viral all the time. I never, ever see Candace clips go viral anymore. Not like before she joined Daily Wire when she was going to congressional hearings and making appearances in other places. She was going viral all the time. I think what's happening here is I think they're losing their ass on her show because I don't think anybody fucking watches it. And I think Ben Shapiro is trying to get her to fucking quit so he doesn't have to pay her anymore. That's what I think's happening. It's not a bad um that's not a bad assessment, genuinely. Like the fact that I'm not I, saying I, it's being an asshole. I, I like Candace. I think she's brilliant. I just think whatever's going on at Daily Wire isn't working for her right now. Well, are you sure they're not just not not promoting her because they don't be, want her viral? Because it's got an Instagram reel, man. Like I make shit go viral out of this room. <laughs> you know? Right. No, that's true. It's it's not a it's not an untrue statement, and you have a point. I do want to give an important shout out uh, to our sponsor for today's show, though. As we jump into this, we're going to go deep down into what's going on with Charlie, the right, and what this means for our movement as a whole. Uh, but guys, don't forget to get a incredible pair of boxers. Um, these boxers from Undertack are amazing. They're extremely comfortable. They're perfect elastic waistband that doesn't ride up uh, on the legs. It doesn't dig in under your gut if you've got a little bit too much. It doesn't stretch too much when you were fat and you lost weight so that they fall down. 
this has a, essentially what it's made out of like cotton on steroids because it's not only caught cotton and breathable, but it also is uh, extremely, extremely like shrink resistant. It doesn't pill. It has the ability to um, last for a lot of, uh, you know, activity. And one of the best parts this company right now is donating to fight human trafficking. So a portion of all of the profits goes to fighting human trafficking. So this is really important. Now, these are battle forces tested, which means they've been used by real men in the field. I've used these in the field with riots and protests. And yes, they're pretty damn comfortable. You don't want to miss them. Most importantly is they come in masculine colors. Christmas is coming up. You can't go wrong with getting a pair, getting a spare. And of course, they are cheaper than the competition in price. But I think that they are they are definitely the same quality, but probably still better in many ways. Go to undertack.com. That's U-N-D-E-R-T-A-C.com. That's undertack.com. Use my promo code OFFENSIVE20, O-F-F-E-N-S-I-V-E-2-0 for 20% off. Check it out at undertack.com. You can check out their shirts and other type of things. They have their whole mission statement. It's a great company. Get the boxers that are trusted, that are not queer and don't have rainbow waistbands, undertack.com, promo code OFFENSIVE20 for 20% off. Uh, I'm currently with Chase Geyser from uh, InfoWars. He also has his own podcast. You should check it out. Links in the description. But I kind of want to talk about this, uh, you know, this what's going on. Let me, uh, let me go here. Let me go to this tab. Uh, what's going on with this Ben Shapiro stuff? Because uh, Candace responded to him saying, you are utterly out of line for suggesting that I cannot quote biblical scripture. The Bible is not about you. And I think that's like a good quote about it's kind of funny and i like candace too i've been on her show i think she's she's talented obviously i'm you know con inc the the conservative inc they've tried to get me out of out of their sphere of influence for many many years um i'm not i really can't say much but i can say this they're treating her better than i think they would um and that means that like like what cernovich said or what you said too is that there's probably some sort of a contract in place that they can't fire her um, or it's going to cost too much money. Now, either she's at the beginning of her contract or if you're at the end, bye-bye, they will fire you publicly and uh, they will try to tarnish your name. They'll try to make sure you never work again. That's how this, this shit works, right? They do it to a lot of people. It's not exclusive uh, to this industry. This happens in a lot of industries. However, I do bring up the very important quote here that um, she's not wrong. That Ben Shapiro literally has been out of line. If people don't know what happened and what she's referring to, Ben Shapiro, I don't know if he knew he was gonna, this was gonna get famous. Uh, always be careful when you're there. But um, this video came out of Ben Shapiro speaking. It's a little bit quiet, so sorry to the audience here. But uh, this is what he had to say about his his employee, which always looks bad. Yes, uh, the, the question is about Candace Owens. I think her behavior during this is disgraceful. Without a doubt. Yeah, and I think she's been absolutely disgraceful. I think that I think that her her faux sophistication on these particular issues has been ridiculous. It's not faux sophistication; it's ridiculous. Everybody can see the moves that she's making and the things that she's saying, and I find them disreputable. Well, when you're five foot two and you have to stand, I like how you have to like stand on a table in like a living room or something. Whatever. This is like a donor meeting. That does make me laugh a little bit. Um, but. I don't know, Chase. What do you think? Like, I, I feel like, you know, he's a professional guy. He started a big empire. I don't want to speak too much crap. You know, like people like to talk a lot of crap on the Daily Wire. It's pretty awesome what they built. They're making a lot of good content. They've been able to create celebrities like um, Brett Cooper out of nothing, right? She kind of like, they've been able to do a lot. But to go up and, you know, and call your, your own employee pseudo intellectual, you know, pseudo sophisticated type of stuff. I feel like this is kind of like showing that maybe facts do care about feelings and maybe he's not he's not even uh, explaining what sh where she got it wrong. He's just kind of mad because she's not going along for the ride. And maybe he's mad not just because of her, but because she's not even getting a lot of pushback for not going along against the ride uh, or going along for the ride. In fact, I would say majority of people support her independent thought. And even if they don't like her, like, yeah, you know, why the hell shouldn't she? Why shouldn't she be allowed to disagree, which is very different from where the establishment right wing has been, which they assume everyone to get on board. And if you don't get on board, they'll fire you, not for being against being on board. They'll just find something else that they were mad, that they never got mad about, and then they'll kick you out for it. You know what I mean? And that's just how it's been yeah. typically. But this this seems different to me. What, what What is your take on this? Well, I, I'm disappointed to see this sort of behavior from Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro is someone that I, I admired. It's, he's someone, frankly, that I still admire. I know that he's gotten a lot of important things wrong. He was wrong about the vaccines being safe and effective. I think he's wrong on this Israel issue. Obviously, he was very antagonistic toward 
Trump in 2016. And he said some things about Breitbart, post facto, and Bannon that I don't like as well. That being said, he's someone who's incredibly bright. He comes off a little bit on the spectrum, frankly, but that could be a good thing. Musk comes off on the spectrum too, and obviously he's brilliant. I think Ben Shapiro is right. When he's right, he's really right. And I think he's wrong about all this stuff. And I think it's really rude and unprofessional the way that he's talking about Candace uh, in this particular context. But ultimately, with The Daily Wire, I'm excited about the things too. I think the movies that they're making are great. I'm excited that they bought the rights to Atlas Shrugged and they're going to make a series based off of Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, something that others have tried to do and failed miserably in terms of quality of content and actually portraying the message of that text and that work accurately. But the, the fact of the matter is, if, if, if you're going to hire somebody and you know these types of issues may come up and you know they're so important, then maybe you should vet during the onboarding process whether or not you want to sign a contract with somebody that you disagree with so vehemently on a particular issue. Everybody gets a pass, in my opinion. There are things that I get emotional about where I lose a little bit of my rational side of my thinking. We're all like this. We, we're all wrong about something major, and we don't know what it is, but other people can see it. That's like a challenge of the human condition. It creates tons of tension and conflict online, especially with political and religious disputes. And I think this is just, this is the thorn in the side. This is Ben Shapiro's Achilles heel. This is the thing that he's really wrong about, but it doesn't make him an evil person or a stupid person or an ignorant person. It's just the thing that as a human being, he's really just missing the target on, in my opinion. Right. And I think, you know, you see memes like this. I want to bring this up. You know, I don't necessarily sponsor memes like this, but, you know, there is a sort of hypocrisy on the right wing, right? Where people are always like identity politics are bad, identity politics are bad. But of course, Jewish identity politics are a part of right-wing media, okay? They just are. It's it's a part of the, the living daylight. And I know a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of people who really, really like Jews, and there's a lot of people who really don't like Jews. Um, I, I happen, maybe, maybe it's because I'm from LA, like I've mentioned, I happen to just know a lot of really awesome people who are ethnically Jewish. I know they don't even think they're ethnically Jewish, but it is an ethnicity. It is, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's at least an ethnicity. Maybe it's not a race, but it's at least an ethnicity. They claimed it's a religion, but then if it's a religion, why do we need a country for a religion? Then we should have Christian nationalism. Maybe they're not wrong. Uh, but I think, you know, it, my argument isn't against this. It's more against the hypocrisy of uh, this, this meme where, you know, we, we're supposed to hear about how identity politics are bad, white people cannot collectivize, white interests are evil, white identitarianism is bad. Of course, when I worked more in the establishment industry, the amount of meetings I had questioning whether I was a white identitarian for just asking questions like I am today, uh, making making me regularly, you know, deny certain things, um, you know, and I was always careful. They're like, do you think it's wrong? Do you, so, but you do think it's wrong for white people to collectivize. And I'd be like, well, I don't know, you know, we'll see. Depends on the situation. I don't think collectivization of any group is inherently bad. I just think depends on what they're trying to accomplish, right? Is what they're trying to accomplish immoral or is it? Is it good or is it bad? I, I'm not entirely sure. And I thought that was funny because, you know, it's like I don't think it's wrong for black people to come together in a community to try to reduce crime or to try to reach out to young black youth and encourage them for something. Do I think BLM is retarded? Of course. Coming together and just being mad over a death that, you know, I mean, George Floyd killed himself, in my opinion, from the toxicology report. And, you know, to, to start burning down buildings and rioting and looting just, you know, for some black collectivist idea. Is that stupid? Yeah. Do I think that like the Tiki Torch March was a little bit stupid? Like it was like bad optics and just like, I don't really understand what that was about. Yeah. I think that kind of stuff's stupid, but white people that come together and say, Hey, we built these countries. We've come together and uh, we, uh, you know, we don't believe, we don't believe that replacement migration is good. We want to be uh, Eurocentric nations. We understand some immigration will occur, right? Nobody's, uh, no, everybody understands that due to business and trade, occasionally certain groups of people, certain individuals will come into a nation for trade purposes, for diplomatic purposes. These are very common things. Um, but do we want open borders and millions of uh, Eritreans and Ethiopians and um, Hispanics coming in, not integrating in the language, not even coming in? Do we want any of this happening? No. Do we want replacement migration legally? No. Do we want all these Indians coming in? Because they're collectivists. An Indian comes in on an H-1B visa. They'll come into a department. And I know this because I have a lot of friends in tech. I'm from California and a lot of techs in California. An Indian will come in. He takes the senior position inside of a tech company in a department. And guess what? Within five years, 
everybody's fired, let go on their contracts, and the entire department is Indian because Indians are collectivists because they understand the, the nature of looking out for your own. And collectivism has been so cucked and beat out of white people um, that I find it to be just funny because I've been saying, I don't think it's a bad idea for white people to unite and come together under certain Eurocentric and Western ideas and values that we've held up for thousands of years um, that we've even you know had this enlightenment. We've been able to get back to these ideas which have strengthened us and we've had, you know, uh, you know, even um, revitalizations of our faith, of Christianity, of beauty. I mean, look at Dresden, right? Dresden was destroyed, but it was able to rebuild. I just don't think we should be abandoning that. You know, I've been called a lot of me names for saying things like that. I've been labeled very rudely uh, by both the media here in Australia and in the United States and several other major Western countries. And then right when I speak against collectivism, you know, in Israel, like the way that they're just indiscriminately, in my opinion, bombing entire neighborhoods uh, and what we're going to look at. I just go, I just don't think that we should be funding that. I don't want to be involved in that. Um, you know, they tell me that I'm wrong for not supporting collectivism. So don't mind me if I don't give a shit about your fucking bullshit and your hip, hip hypocrisy, because you're, you've been telling me for years, not just our, not just people that look like me, but, but me particularly, I grew up in California. I was told I was bad. I was you know, that, you know, Nazism, white supremacy, these are all the greatest threats. We can't have racial, you know, monocultures. And then you tell me if I don't support a racial monoculture, now I'm racist as well. I, like just, I mean, I'm sorry, but I just don't buy it because you can't have both be true at the same time. Am I the only one that see, sees that chase or is that, does, does that not like raise alarm for you in sort of like a hypocrisy that I feel like we're getting conflicting messages here and maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're right. But like, what what is it? It's collectivization and monoculture and working towards you know identity. A bad thing? Is it a good thing? Because both can't be true at the same time. In according to what I've seen. Yeah, I think it's a really good question, and I think that you can really get into the weeds with this. Primarily, what I would say the issue is, is that we have allowed for the conflation of race and culture in argument, debate, political discourse. So specifically, we saw from the wokists or the leftists the last several years, ideas like mathematics being, you know, a white value or punctuality being a white value. All of these things that actually have nothing to do with race whatsoever being attributed or associated psychologically with different races and then criticized as a result of that. So anything that is white is out of this whiteness idea, this white privilege idea, and then anything that is of a minority is sort of indicative of this oppressed class that we have to protect or compensate for this oppression for, right? And the issue is, I don't necessarily, I wouldn't frame it like I believe in white collectivism. I wouldn't frame it like I believe in black collectivism or Indian collectivism or Jewish collectivism. What I think about are different cultures and whether or not cultures are better. Because I think culture is something you can assimilate to. It's not an immutable characteristic. And I think therefore some cultures, unlike races, are inherently superior and some are inherently inferior to others. So for example, Western culture is really brilliant at being creative. We innovate. If you look at the most famous composers of all time, many of them are products of Western culture. You got the Mozarts, you got the Beethovens, you got the, uh, the others. And in Chinese culture, for example, Eastern culture, they're very good at discipline and sort of reflecting or mimicking or copying these brilliant composers but they don't compose themselves. Like you can't really name a famous Asian composer, certainly not from the Renaissance period or the Romantic period or the Baroque period. It's, it's more difficult to name these creative geniuses. So different cultures have different strengths and weaknesses to other cultures. So I would say that in America, we have demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt that Western culture is so far the most superior culture of any culture that's ever existed in the world, at least depending on what our objective is, right? Whether it's prosperity, class shifting, bringing the poor out of poverty, Western culture is superior. Now, Western culture is not something exclusive to white people. There are black people that participate in Western culture. There are Asians, Indians, Native Americans, whatever race you can possibly imagine that's come into what used to be a melting pot has participated in Western culture. And so when I think about this collectivist idea, I think we need to think about it in terms of what cultures and ideals and values we have as opposed to what races we want in or we want out. It's easy to conflate them because there's such a high correlation, but correlation is not causation. So I don't have a problem with millions of people coming to America, but they need to come to America to be Americans, not Palestinians in America, not Mexicans in America, not Indians in America, not Chinese people in America. 
You have to come to America to be an American. And that's the problem with this border policy that we have right now is that we're importing over 10 million people now, according to some estimates, into the country since the Biden administration came into power. And we're not importing people that want to be American. We're importing people that want to be in America doing un-American things. Well, yeah. And I think one of the, the only the only collectivism I honestly fight for is um, Aboriginal collectivism. I think we should um, continue to we should give them the whole country of Australia. Actually, um, it's the most important thing. Every country I move to, I find out that white people are bad um, and I visit and that the people who were there originally um, are the good people. Uh, deep red pill, though. Those weren't the original people. There's actually an entire history that is intentionally kept down. Evolution is fake. They have an exact timeline. People think that we're elevated. We're actually devolving. And we can talk about that on a whole other show. Our brains go deep. I keep it very, very, uh, uh, very okay on the show in terms of not too deep. But the reality is there is a deeper um, below even the surface of some of the, uh, the monuments. That's why they don't allow you to dig in certain sites. Um, because we're talking about Nephilim, we're talking about uh, a course of history protecting and guarding people from realizing that there was a judgment on the earth. And so everything's a fucking lie uh, that you know today. And that being said, there's a there's a reason why um, that even goes further and forward of why they don't want uh, there to be an equation. Because Chase, because I agree with you that we are a Western culture, but that Western culture is inherently white. Now, that doesn't mean that all white people are Western. And that doesn't mean that all Western people are white, right? So I think that that it's a very um, difficult argument to have today because people have so coaxed us into thinking that if you even you know utter sort of words like this, that you're probably um, you know you hate people. But it's not that you hate anyone; it's actually that you love your children and your offspring so much. You know, I who I hate is my parents' generation and their parents' generation who inherited a very wonderful country with a great trajectory and have destroyed it into a neoliberal uh, shitocracy, which is different than a theocracy, right? They were given a religious fundamental future uh, of, of, of a monoculture, of understanding and of ethos, and they were uh, ruined it, is particularly post-World War II. And I think that a lot of people recognize that and realize that the world that we see today only began really really ultimately, you know, in the 1960s. Um, and that's just the, the, the straight up truth. Um, these are with the Immigration Reform Act. And this has also happened if you go look at New Zealand, Australia, uh, Canada, the United Kingdom, the United States, it all pretty much happened within the same four or five years. When we changed ethnically the makeup of our countries, we did lose our culture. So there is a direct connection between between race and ethnicity and culture. Uh, but I think for forever, right? I mean, even, even here, there was a lot of Chinese people in, in Australia for a long time, even in, even in uh, the United States, like even the UK, there's always been some Indian people. There's always been certain groups of people that, you know, like I said, for whatever reason, immigrated, maybe even um, people forget this. When I say diplomatic immigration, I mean, like literally like, you know, they might be involved in a war in India or the UK and there's families that help and they're allowed to immigrate and get citizenship. And there's different types of things. So you don't want to just be inherently hateful of somebody, especially as a Christian who's different than you. But you also have to realize that we can't, we can't not understand that there's a link between ethnicity and culture. That's why the Jews are so big on that. Like the Jews are, so, that's why I support them in their ethnic strive because they realize that yes, Christians live in Israel, Jews live in Israel, Muslims live in Israel. There's a lot of different and secularists live in Israel. There's a lot of a lot of ideas, but there still has to be a similar value set. And the easiest way to get citizenship in that country, or one of the only ways, is by being ethnically Jewish or being able to trace your lineage back, because that's the most strong indicator that you support that culture. Again, you could support it, right? I mean, I know tons of black people who are more Western than the white people that I know with their blue hair and you know, rings in their nose. And so it's not to be racist. It's just to be honest, in my opinion. But I do want to bring this up real quickly. Uh, what Cernovich said here about this, that I just want to remind people not to, um, let me see if I can bring, I think it's right here. I want to see what Cernovich said here about Ben Shapiro, because we got to, we need to talk about this. You can disagree with my statement, but I want to make sure we look at this comment. Um, he's talked to, talking about, Cern, about, uh, Ben Shapiro here. And said he's become indistinguishable from a far left wing identity politics woke psycho. He's working the soft cancel culture angle now. I didn't fire Candace. She quit. But he could also look up what a constructive termination is. Um, he said that he got a lot of things wrong in his previous tweets. He got a lot wrong on Trump. He got a lot wrong on the vaccines. Uh, he just got a lot wrong. And it is the interesting thing where this is kind of where I was attributing is saying, 
you know, you don't want to be a, an identitarian psycho, meaning you don't want to assume just because someone's white, they agree with you. You know, like I have friends who are not white who I agree with fundamentally more than some of my own biological family members. I mean, so, I mean, there's, there's really a distinction to be made, right? This is not as historical as, as some things, but when you, be, when you become identitarian at this foresight of starting to attack your own allies, like you, you're so set on this, this group think that you lose the plot. You know, I think that's what a lot of people do. I think even, you know, people that see the, the struggle with white identity, I mean, with the white persecution get so set on white identitarianism that they forget how to be effective or to like, you know, everything's just like, oh, fuck the Jews and this and that. And it's all, and they don't like know it's like, hey, there are other issues out there. And you also got to like be constructive and like, what are you saying? Are you effectively speaking? Are you thinking through your statements? And brother, there's probably a lot of people who are ethnically Jewish who probably agree with you that it's wrong. You know, they say, oh, well, 90% of Jews, you know, agree with this. Well, there's 10% that don't. So you can't just say everybody who's Jewish disagrees or hates you because that's not true. And I feel like that's what Ben Shapiro's become, where he's just like, he's so identitarian on the Jewish stuff that he's just like, he gets like this, but he did this with the vaccines and he did this with Trump. He gets so set on his like, that I'm right, that he just loses the plot, man. Like, I feel like this is just a dangerous thing. And it shows that even if you have millions of dollars and are, you know, went to Harvard, you're still susceptible for it just as much as the, you know, neo-Nazi that he claims to hate, that he says is identitarian. He's just as susceptible to this because he's a fucking human and humans are retarded. And we sometimes do dumb shit like this. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that he's definitely falling into the trap of identity politics. I think Cerno's analysis is absolutely right. And I think... What we've seen from Ben Shapiro over the years is someone who is very right about most politics as long as it doesn't conflict with the interests of Israel. Most of the things that he's done that I disagree with are actually things that line up more with sort of BB initiatives. Obviously, BB was very big on the vaccine. I believe the vaccines were forced upon the Israelis during his leadership, under his leadership, and certainly under the leadership that existed in Israel during the pandemic. The vaccines were pushed on the population, so Ben Shapiro was all for it. Trump was a little bit of an unpredictable, loose cannon in terms of how foreign policy was going to play out in 2015. So consequently, we see somebody like Ben Shapiro supporting Ted Cruz because he knew Ted Cruz was going to be a little bit more predictable. He's going to play ball, perhaps with the establishment a little more in terms of foreign policy. There was a clear sort of Judeo-Christian value that was going to strengthen the alliance between Israel and the United States. Of course, Trump surprised everyone with his embassy being moved to Jerusalem. So I really think that every time Ben Shapiro slips up, it's actually because he's sort of choosing a political position that's more conducive or in line with a political position in Israel than what is conducive or in line with the interests of America. And frankly, like we said at the beginning of the show, it's because he's an Israel first guy. And I don't blame him for being an Israel first guy. That's fine with me if he is, especially since I think he's explicit about it. But we as an audience if we are America first patriots, if that is our disposition or our position on the matter, should just understand that about him. So we got to take what he says with a grain of salt. I agree with about maybe, I don't know, 40 or 50% of everything Bill Maher says. Half the other stuff he says is totally appalling to me. And so whenever he says anything, I just take it with a grain of salt. It's okay, you know, this is something that I may or may not agree with. It's a 50-50 shot. Same with Joe Rogan. I love Joe Rogan. I adore the guests that he has. I think he has great questions. But I also know that the guy practically endorsed Bernie Sanders. And Bernie Sanders, I think, is a dirtbag. And I think that things like universal basic income are economically the most retarded thing possible because it's just going to inflate prices. And we know that everybody that's going to get that money is just going to blow it on everything, which is probably why they're trying to bring in the CBDC so they can control how the money is spent for the welfare state that they're trying to create. That's another story too. But the point that I'm trying to make is it, it doesn't make Ben a bad person. It just makes him an Israel first guy. And so I'm just not in a position where I want to bitch about Ben all day because I don't give a fuck what Ben thinks. Like when he's brilliant, he's brilliant. And I appreciate it. And when he's stupid, he's stupid. And I'll just move on to something else until he's brilliant again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's not a bad statement. I think one of the interesting things, though, and I don't want to bitch about him all day. I think it's to remind people, though, of what gatekeeping is with ideas because yeah, because it's more or less like the, I, the, the showing here to me of – like I don't care that I, everyone knows he's Israel first. The point is that he's yeah. like he's trying to get an employee out for disagreeing with him on the issue. Yeah, which I'm is just you. what 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 does shock me a little bit. And the reason why I bring this up is there's something called like petty 10.0, right? Because uh, Cernovich talked about how um, Ben you know got a lot wrong, and I just want to remind people that people are so petty about. 
people are so petty in this industry that like, I mean, if you go to this, people always share this, this, uh, this picture, right? In other words, get the vaccine dopes from Ben Shapiro. Now, what they, what they did is the reason why this is the crop is because he was actually responding to me. So this is a conversation we had. Um, mm -hmm. And they like people are so petty that while they claim to not like Ben, they hate me more, certain people in this industry. So they've cropped me out because they don't even want to mention that Ben was talking to me because they don't want to give me credit for winning an argument with Ben. So they just leave me out of it entirely <laughs> and say that Ben was just talking to random people. No, he was talking right. to this audience directly. He was talking to the slightly offensive backers because we were in, I was having a discussion that Ben was incorrect. And and Ben was so petty with me back then that he even wouldn't quote tweet me. He had to screenshot me and put it up because he was trying not to activate this audience because this audience isn't big. But for some reason, well, this show's not even big, but we always have a big footprint in terms of like, we just get involved in weird shit throughout the years. We will get involved more too. Like I mentioned, I'm in Australia now, so we're just doing remote interviews. We're not going to get too much waves going on, but I have some really great things lined up back in the US when I get back. I've just been here longer uh, than than I than I planned, but I'm enjoying it, right? I have a son. My wife's around her family. It's been nice. Those of you who are married understand that. And also, uh, I really don't want to get J6'd. So as we'll talk about in a little bit, we'll switch over to some of the, the Owen Schroyer stuff. I know you're filling in for him. Um, we'll get into that in about, about five or ten minutes here. Uh, but – you know, when I look at this, it's like, that's how petty people are. You know, like Ben Shapiro and I, you know, I ended up winning an argument and there are people today I saw sharing this, cropping it out because, and they don't even mention like, you remember Ben Shapiro told everyone they were dopes? It's like, no, 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 you are just as bad as Ben Shapiro. And that's why I think it's funny. You're saying you don't want to just bitch about Ben Shapiro. It's like the same people who are bitching are just as petty, just as upset. How, you know, oh, he's attacking Candace. There are people who will just drunk tweet shit about me at three in the morning with no evidence, delete it in the morning, and they're complaining today about Ben being petty. It's like, motherfucker, you are petty. Like like sure. you said, we all have dumb shit. I'm petty in my own ways. You're probably petty in your own ways. Sure. We all have problems. So this is not a point the finger. We need to try to do better on our own. We need to try to improve. Like, I wish I didn't, you know, I wish I didn't uh, use swear words so much. But when I get passionate, I just you know can't help myself. I hope to get disciplined one day. It's like you're so, like Tony Robbins, just lean into it, man. Yeah, you just well, yeah, you just yeah, lean into it. But but I meant like so I'm trying to improve myself. I'm trying to work on myself. So I'm not going to just tear down Ben. But what I do bring up is is what is interesting about this war is this. You're going to like this. I'm going to play this clip here. Uh, yeah, is the same people who have gate kept and gate kept kind of forget the fact that perhaps maybe. Like how Ben was like, oh, fuck Elijah, this and that. And you know, this, a lot of this had to do with sort of my exit from this whole industry. But a lot of this comes down to them talking shit on us, but we're right. And you work with InfoWars. I've always worked with InfoWars. I love InfoWars. I, have, I love Owen, good friend of mine. Um, can we remember who first found Candace or platformed her? Oh, check this out. Check this old clip out. Before she was with PragerU and she used to work with Blaze and Daily Wire. Who, where, where was Candace Owens? Who discovered her and realized that she had something good or two to say? Let's see. Thanks for coming into town. I'm so happy to be here. Great to have you. Uh, you're even more impressive in person. It, it's uh, wonderful to have you. Where should you start the few months we got to break? I think you should recap right. what the feminist cult tried to do to you. Uh, you know, in your own words, they just thought basically you're a woman. Uh, you're reportedly, you know, supposedly a minority, uh, and then you, so you belong to them. Right. Um, absolutely. So long story short, I was creating, I considered myself a Democrat and a liberal about a year and a half ago as Trump was kind of rising up. Um, I can, I was trying to build a product called Social Autopsy, which uh, Paul just mentioned. And essentially, I thought I was creating something that was going to help stomp out bullying. The my passion behind it was well intended, but it was totally naive and not something that now I know that I shouldn't have done. And while I was doing that product, um, I was contacted by these, you know, self proclaimed feminists, and they basically tried to take me out. The same women that were saying that they were being attacked by anonymous trolls on the internet were telling me that they didn't want to figure out who these anonymous trolls were. Um, and long story short, I figured out that these girls were harassing themselves, that it was all a lie, and that there was no movement of white male conservatives that were stalking and harassing these girls. And when I made that statement, the left media came after me and tried to smear me. And it was then. I mean, but I mean, is that a shocker chase? I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, the uh, Alex found her and gave her a platform because she was trying to speak the truth. And, 
you know, the same people that have pushed Alex out have pushed you out or different people over the years. I mean, they're forced to reconcile maybe the fact, you know, through all of COVID everything, you know, we may not have had as big of platforms as them. We may not have been as effective as them in reaching people, but they can never say that we were wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, that's an amazing clip. I actually didn't even know until today that Candace got her started in Wars. And there's a lot of people like that, that sort of springboard off of InfoWars into some trajectory, but it's not to say that InfoWars is responsible for their success because success unearned is something that's not sustainable. Obviously, Candace is very talented. Others who have gone into and out of InfoWars are very talented as well, but Alex Jones is really an icon, and I don't think there's ever gonna be anybody else like him. Not only has he been right about so many things years in advance, for example, on March 6th of 2001, he predicted that a 747 was gonna fly into the World Trade Center. Recently found that clip doing some research behind the scenes for InfoWars. But he's also been right about a lot of people before anyone else sort of noticed them. He's great at sort of spotting someone who's got an insight that maybe is a little counterintuitive to whatever the current zeitgeist is, but it's going to be right on the money with the zeitgeist in six months or 12 months or three years or five years when things really start to play out. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's the truth. I think the right does the same thing. Obviously, the right doesn't have the benefit of the mass media sort of machine, this like deep state machine that can just come and just slaughter you and tear you down and put you up on media matters and get you on the Southern Poverty Law Center website or on ADL's website as a hate list. That's a whole different type of weapon that the left has sort of exclusively in their, in their armory, so to speak. But the right does the same thing. If we have people that switch teams, if we have people that turn over from one side to the other, we tear them down as well. I mean, we saw this happen with a lot of the um, January 6th stuff that played out, a lot of the impeachment inquiries that played out, played out with right-wingers who sort of turned on Trump. Right now it's happening with Jenna Ellis, right? She testified against Trump and everybody's turning on her, rightfully so. But that's just what happens when you're a turncoat. People on your side are going to be really pissed off that you switch teams. And, you know, that that's just the nature of it. And you can be successful despite it. Frankly, people love you even more when you're the underdog. It's probably the reason why people so eagerly support countries like Israel and Ukraine, because Jewish people are inherently sort of perceived as underdogs because of things like the Holocaust. Ukraine obviously is perceived as an underdog because Russia is this sort of monolith. Everybody is just inclined to root for the underdog. It's the rags to riches story. It's, it's really an American thing. This idea, this American dream is starting with nothing moving to the top. And so honestly, it, it could be a really good thing when you get canceled like that, because then it has it escalates this next level of devo devotion among the audience, though smaller, but more loyal that you have remaining in the end. Yeah, and it's always nice to have that. I do want to give, uh, speaking of that, I do want to make sure that I want to give a shout out to our uh, other sponsor of today. Um, I've been uh, trying to make sure that I don't have too many sponsors coming up. We will have regular programming. I'll be making a lot more shows. We'll continue going. Um, I've just ran into some serious medical uh, issue in the last month, and it's been really, really tough um, to to uh, operate and drive and different things. And if you know anything about Australia, this is not a place that you want to fuck around and find out with the police. You don't want to, trust me, so you don't want to be driving on uh, narcotics and stuff. I'm proud to say I am no longer on narcotics as of a few days ago officially, so that's good. Um, some of you guys were worried about me getting addicted to those things or whatever. And good, you should be worried because those things were great. But um, they also have horrible side effects, uh, including making you irritable, uh, not being able to drive, and uh, also making you constipated, which um, is terrible because not only do I eat and create my own shit, but I go on the internet and see shit every day. And to not be able to get it out uh, of my uh, heart because my brain isn't working right or from other parts of me that are much less interesting uh, to everyone except for those who like ceviche, Hopefully you guys get that reference. Uh, then uh, that's the truth. But I want to explain something. So as you, can, you guys could see here, uh, I was drinking a monster. I don't usually drink monsters on the show anymore, but that's because I ran out of My Vital C. Now I recently just uh, am getting a new shipment sent to me right now. Now My Vital C is the greatest energy supplement. And the reason why is, is because it does two things that are really important. Number one, it not only gives you a jolt of energy, but it gives you energy without the crash. So it's sustained energy. It's not like just a jolt of boom, I have energy and I'm moving. What this is, is it actually gives you sustained focus, clarity, and even helps you get better rest. When this compound, ESS-60, it's ESS-60 in oil, olive oil. Now, we had a, the guy, the doctor, uh, I mean, the scientist on the show. Um, the reason why it works so well is you use the olive oil, the really natural high-quality olive oil as a suspension to hold this, this molecule, ESS-60, 
which not only doubled the, the, the life of the test subjects, but it also just seemed to help in a lot of areas that would help with energy. So it's not just like caffeine or guarana or any of these chemicals that give you that jump. This doesn't make your stomach upset. It doesn't make you irritable. It doesn't make you feel jittery. It doesn't make you crash. It doesn't get in the way of your sleep. You know, you take a teaspoon in the morning, five milliliters, maybe, maybe I've had a little bit more. Um, and it gives you a, you know, a nice longevity of that clarity and that focus to have energy. So if you're over 25, you're already starting to feel that, you know, lethargic mode, you want more energy for your family. You want to try something out that's more healthy, that is actually high quality, uh, that is better than the competition. And with a, um, you know, a, a owner and an operator who actually cares about health, I would check this out right now at myvitalc.com slash offensive. That's M-Y-V-I-T-A-L-C.com slash offensive. Links in the description. Use my promo code offensive for $15 off. Myvitalc.com slash offensive. They just renewed with the show too, which means that a lot of you guys, they said, purchase this product. Um, they made back their investment and a lot more and they've invested back in the show. You know, I have a lot of other sponsors that want to that want to renew and stuff. I've just been trying not to put as many ads in the show right now because uh, we've been, uh, you know, I've just been like really all over the place. But I really appreciate you guys uh, supporting yourself and your health at myvitalc.com slash offensive. Make sure that you check it out. And, of course, I'm here with my guest, Chase Geyser. You make sure that you follow him. Uh, he's on InfoWars right now in the morning show. Uh, we're going to transition to this topic a little bit about uh, sort of what we were discussing um, of like serious topics that are going on. Um, we have a bunch of clips as well that we can play from Candace. She was on Tucker. I don't think we're going to get into that at the moment. Um, but I want to talk about something very serious here. So, you know, we talked a lot about gatekeeping. You brought up the J6 thing, people being split. I just got an update um, right here. Let me, let me bring it up on the screen uh, about Owen Schroyer. Owen Schroyer is a friend of the show. He works for InfoWars. And uh, it was said here that uh, an update on him that Owen will remain in solitary confinement until November 28th at the earliest. At that time, his normal privileges will be reinstated. For now, he was only able to communicate via mail. Despite 23 hours a day of lockdown, he remains in good spirits, saying that he's as mentally strong as ever. Chase, you're filling in for him right now. Um, and from a personal level, I mean, we read this stuff online, uh, but what do you know about Owen? I mean, I mean, we know he's in jail as an update, really, for uh, thought crimes, for speech crimes. I mean, they say he violated a court order, but the court order is kind of bullshit. And also, ultimately, this was a politically motivated attack. That's what we believe, an attack on the First Amendment. You're filling in for him. So tell us what's what's going on here and how, how did you get into the position of filling in for him? And what do you think is going to be happening uh, with uh, the show, with Owen, with InfoWars? We're really uh, invested in this story. Yeah, that's a great question. So where should I start? Uh, I met Owen for the first time when I started working full time for InfoWars in the beginning of July. Owen's office is a couple of offices down the hall from mine at InfoWars. I would say that I know him sort of in passing. He's been in my office a few times. I've been in his office a few times. I've made a lot of content for his show. I do a lot of the AI content, AI videos for InfoWars. But he's not somebody I've known for a very long period of time, so I don't want to mischaracterize my friendship with him. I consider him a friend. Uh, we've exchanged texts and spent some time together one-on-one, -on -one, but it's not somebody that I've known for an extended period of time. Basically, what we know at InfoWars is the same as what you're hearing from that Twitter account. I highly encourage you to, to follow that and support Owen in any way you can, specifically by spending, sending letters his way. But my understanding of what happened is basically he violated this bullshit court order that you said by being on the Capitol grounds. I'm not even sure that he was aware that he was in a, a territory around the Capitol that he wasn't supposed to be. He never went into the Capitol building on January 6th. He was just seen there. And what happened was the prosecution made him feel as if basically in a handshake deal that if he were to cooperate with them and do things like plead guilty and turn over his cell phone voluntarily to them, that they would ensure that there would be no prison time for him. So he did all of those things and then they reneged on that. And the real sort of damning thing about what they did that makes it so sort of sick and fucked up is in the sentencing recommendation documents because for the crime in which he pled guilty, pleaded guilty, excuse me, you can technically be sentenced to up to 12 months in prison. In the sentencing recommend, recommendation document, they recommended that he be sentenced for 120 days. He was eventually sentenced to 60. And they cited things that he said on the air after the alleged crime in which he had pled, pleaded guilty to. That's what's kind of fucked up about it. It's like this post facto enforcement. So when you go to prison or when you serve any time for a crime that you've committed, it's supposed to be for the crime that you committed and you can use evidence up until that point to sort of get a conviction and maybe inform the sentencing. But 
none of the speech that you have after, none of the free expression of the freedom of the press that you have after is supposed to have an impact on that sentencing. That was what was really fucked up about it. That's why you hear things like people say that he's in prison for his free speech. It's because that sentencing recommendation document was so explicit about some of the things that he said, saying he's not remorseful. And it was just criticism of the Biden administration and, and you know, expressing doubt about the legitimacy of the election in 2020 that they used sort of in that document to put him away. So he's supposed to be out on Christmas Eve. I anticipate that he probably will be out on Christmas Eve. I think that they're probably going to do everything that they can to keep him in solitary. The reason he's in solitary now, as I understand it, is because we did download a recorded phone call where he had a message that he shared with the audience in that recording. And we broadcasted it. And I think they put him in solitary, though I'm not 100% sure, because he was technically broadcasting from prison, which I guess is against the rules, even though it really wasn't him doing it. It was us taking the call and putting it up. That's, they're just basically being assholes is what, what, what the deal is. They want to make it as painful as possible. They want to set an example with them. And so <laughs> since I worked already full time at InfoWars and since I had guest hosted to fill in when people called it sick, went on vacation, I was sort of just in the right place at the right time to fill in in the morning for the American Journal show while Harrison, who's usually the host of that show, fills in for Owen's War Room show in the afternoon. And we're just going to do that until Owen gets back in December. InfoWars is doing okay, but we can always use your support at InfoWarsStore.com or just by going to infowars.com forward slash show and sharing the link. Uh, but this place will be there. Infowars will be on the air broadcasting when he gets back. He will always have a home there. So as far as I understand. Yeah. Cause I mean, I just don't know what's, what's going on, but I know that um, first of all, we're very happy. He's jacked. He's handsome. He's rich mm -hmm. and he's doing good. Uh, be, we're very happy, right? The boys, because ultimately they can't, they can't take your freedom away because freedom is internal, right? They can lock you mm -hmm. up, but we have to learn to be joyful in all circumstances. It's very important to take life one day at a time because you really never know what's going to happen. Now, you know, I remember for a while, you know, I was tempted to, to get bitter at a lot of people in my life. Uh, you know, I feel like, you know, even I've wronged certain people, certain people have wronged me throughout my, my 30 years here on life. Um, but, you know, there's been moments even now where I, where I feel bitter, um, uh, you know, even at the, the, the Biden administration for not closing my case for J6, you know, and keeping open this pending investigation on wiretapping because it's bullshit. And, 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 you know, I don't know, you know, whether I'm going to go to jail, but I look at someone like Owen and I realize, you know, seeing that he say his, 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 his mode and his, his mind is strong. You know, it's not all about you today. It's not all about me today. Um, we need to remember that there's always people, you know, and even if we look at Owen, you can go, oh, well, it's really bad. He's in solitary. Well, there's people that are not getting out on Christmas Eve, that are not getting out next Christmas Eve, that are not getting out, you know, in 10 years Christmas Eve. Um, persecution, pain, and suffering are a part of the, the lived experience, especially if you're fighting for the truth and you'll make enemies. But, but guys, we need to be remembering to get our eyes off ourselves and praying for these people, praying for Owen. And making sure that, you know, you don't forget just because InfoWars has taken off all social media that you're still supporting InfoWars, you know, that you're still going to, I think Bandot Video still works too, right? You still go to that. That's oh, great. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they got to they gotta be going. And I bring this up because, you know, like, remember even Trump, right? Trump gets, get, you mentioned this about uh, Jenna Ellis, uh, you know, betraying Trump. Um, you know, she was, uh, she was subpoenaed and, you know, asked about Trump. And she turned on him in a second. And I think it's lies, honestly. I don't think this is honesty. Yeah. Um, but she lied about Trump and threw him under the bus to get her own plea deal. Listen to what she had to say. Remember, this is Jenna Ellis. You can find her. Um, and this is how quickly people will betray you. So you think your friends, you think your government are safe, you think your family is safe. Remember, betrayal um, from Jesus Christ, you know, to, to, you know, in the garden to now, you know, we are still dealing with this this plight of human suffering and this is crazy i know this is a bit old but i've been away from from the video for the last week and i have to play this so we remember who our enemies are uh in this dog fight to to restore sanity um to the country okay and uh at the time uh period where they were going to start to discuss what was uh dan scavino's role at the time i believe his title was social media director for the White House, it became Deputy Chief of Staff um, at the time that the conversation and question took place. Okay, and when was that? The conversation was around December 19th of 2020 uh, at the White House Christmas party. And I uh, emphasized him, I thought that the, um, the, the claims and the ability to challenge uh, the election results was essentially over because he said um, to me in a kind of excited tone, well, we don't care and we're not going to leave. And I said, what do you mean? 
And he said, well, the boss, meaning President Trump and everyone understood the boss. Um, that's what we all called him. Um, he said the boss uh, is not going to leave under any circumstances. We are just going to stay in power. And I said to him, well, it doesn't quite work that way, you realize. And all right. Uh, I'm just going to be sexist here for a second. It's like, I've been what around a, a lot of, uh, yeah, <laughs> what a fucking bitch. I've, I've seen a lot of women lie the last couple of years and I've seen a lot of women lie under testimony and I know how women lie and they're like, and then he did this and then he did that. And then he said, the boss is going to be here. And you're like, oh, fucking shut My up. Starbucks you, is cold. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's like, like, you know, it's like, shut the fuck up with your bullshit to get, because, because women, honestly, this is one thing I'll say this. There's a lot of great women out there and this is not a show that shits on, on women, but we're honest about women on the show. And one of the honest things is that women don't usually work for the good of the world or for people. They work for the good of themselves and their immediate circle. And they like to look good. Women don't like to look bad. This is one dangerous part about having women involved in politics. Um, not that all women involved in politics have been a net negative not that all women but women being involved in politics has been a net negative um overall and the reason why people get really offended by that and it's because uh men lie to retain power uh so men will lie politically for political reasons and women will lie mostly for personal reasons um and so that's actually the truth um and it's because they are upset or it's going to cause a problem uh and so they'll just lie to to continue to get the favor of the collective group um because they don't want to look bad and you don't want to be she doesn't want to go to jail or whatever not they're not able to to realize that they're being used um and she's working with the enemy so Jenna Ellis is out I don't know what you thought about this but to me this just reminds me with Owen being betrayed by our own government, that these people, these this is our government. These are these are the people that used to work in the government, right? Whether it's our team or their team, people are pieces of shit regardless. Yeah, well, it's like, it reminds me of Otto Warmbier. I don't know if you remember that story from years ago. He was a, a high school student or a college student. I think he was a college student at the time in North Korea. He allegedly took a poster off of a wall and tried to take it back with him. They arrested him and sentenced him to hard labor. But before they sentenced him, they forced him to do this sort of memorized confession where he was doing this sort of exaggerating pleading for mercy and he ended up dying but trump was able to get him back just sort of moments before his death after the obama administration basically did nothing to get him back from imprisonment in north korea north korea said they he died of botulism but it seemed like he might have been tortured because i don't think everything lined up with the effects of botulism but it reminded me when i saw this janet ellis clip of that clip of him making his confession from north korea that it was aired internationally and there's a couple of things that just don't fucking line up about what she said, man. The first thing is she's saying that Trump wasn't going to leave under any circumstances, but he actually left very easily on January 20th, very voluntarily. He didn't steal shit like paintings. He didn't, I mean, he kind of threw a fit because he didn't go to the inauguration, but that was like petty. That wasn't like criminal, like, you know, holding on to the door frame as they fucking dragged him out. Like he fucking left. So what she says he said doesn't even fucking matter because he, he actually did just leave. The second thing is, in any court of law, hearsay is not like usable evidence. It's an objectionable point to make in the court of law. So she's not saying what Trump said to her. She's saying what Trump supposedly said to someone that who then said it to her, right? So this guy told me that Trump told him is not fucking evidence. That's hearsay, objection hearsay. Some of the other ways that she characterized, like the tone of voice and the attitude of the person that she was speaking with. Is, is subjective as well, right? In an excited tone or what I felt like, it's just fucking bullshit. Like she's obviously been intimidated into doing this. She buckled very easily. I'm very pleased to see that everything she tweets now on her Twitter account is being absolutely ratioed. She's tweeting shit as like, if nothing else happened, she's just like tweeting normal Republican shit. It's just getting ratioed, it's like, you know, get the fuck out. But I, I totally agree with you, you know, on, on your take on this. I think that she is obviously someone of, of her conviction isn't very important to her. She totally buckled under pressure, unlike Owen Schroyer, who, despite knowing that there was a risk, said, fuck you to the man. He's going to prison over it, and he's going to come out stronger than ever with a more affirmative audience than ever. And that's what you have to do. You have to do civil disobedience if you want to change these fucking people. And obviously, Jenna Ellis is not up to the task of any sort of civil disobedience. No, I know. And I think um, I think one of the crazy things, though, is like we have to see is like – with women in politics, like what I noticed is um, Kathy Hochul, the governor of, of New York, and uh, Nikki Haley, the president of Israel, uh, got together and um, they ended up agreeing. And I, I rarely see women agree. Besides agreeing to shit talk each other behind their backs, uh, women rarely can uh, agree on anything, right? And, you know, 
so I, I find it to be very interesting. You know, we have women on this show. Um, we pro should probably stop doing that. But, <laughs> but the, but, 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 but I, but I will say, I will say, uh, Nikki Haley, right? She was, uh, she was on a typical shit show of just talking about nonsense. And, she's um, retarded. Yeah, she's retarded, but she, um, you know, was busy. She's like, the, she's like the mom in like the uh, the parent teacher conference. You know, it's like I'm not sure my kid should be reading Catcher in the Rye. He has a hooker in it. Like, yeah, know? I know. She's like, only my husband should be seeing hookers while I, yeah, like, my yeah. pussy dried up ten she's years ago. Karen, and man. Yeah, she hasn't had sex with her husband in ten years, and then she gets mad at him for like leaving her or whatever. These are the kind of people they are. But she uh, decided that she was going to start some sort of like a. Um, just listen to this. When I get into office, the first thing we have to do, social media accounts, social media companies, they have to show America their algorithms. Let us see why they're pushing what they're pushing. The second thing is every person on social media should be verified by their name. That's, first of all, it's a national security threat. When you do that, all of a sudden, people have to stand by what they say, and it gets rid of the Russian bots, the Iranian bots, and the Chinese bots. And then you're going to get some civility when people know their name is next to what they say. Accountability. And they know their past. So as we're fighting anti-Semitism, we're going to make this giant database of people. And we're going to force, the government's going to force people. Oh, everybody's going to get a number. They're going to get a tattooed on their fucking arm. <laughs> uh, dude, and she was saying you all have to use your real names. <laughs> I, but she was saying the best part was that she's going, you have to use your real name. But I, I remember, where is this? I'm going to see if I can remember her real name. I can't pronounce it off the top of my head. Yeah. But isn't her name Maramata like, or whatever. yeah, Emiratu Makuto or something? Or her name is, yeah, her yeah. name is uh, Nimrata Wandawa. I mean, I'm not even joking. That's her yeah. real name. Is, she's is more Nimrata. Indian sounding than Ramaswamy. Yeah, she, his name is Nimrata Randawa. She's actually white. Uh, Ra Vivek is white. And so is, oh, and then... um. What's her name? Uh, I don't Warren? know why. No, no. What's that bitch? That's the vice president. Kamala Harris is uh, mm -hmm. black now, right? She was Indian, but she's black. But it's like it's crazy. She's like people need to use their real names, and it's like a woman who doesn't use her real name anywhere wants us all to use our real names, dude. This is why I think I don't know what's fake and what's not. Like I would think this is like a joke, right? You're yeah, like, yeah. So it, Benjamin it, Franklin it, can't be silenced. Do good. You know, the Federalist Papers were written by people under fucking pseudonyms. And the part that's really retarded about it is the fact that that if you expose the algorithm, who's going to have the most capacity to game the algorithm? Well, it's going to be the governments, right? They're going to have the resources to go in, study the algorithm, and game it. It doesn't actually get rid of bots. It just makes the bots even more sophisticated. So, like, everything she says is just sort of like this boomer shit. I don't want to just bash all boomers. There's some boomers I really admire. But, like, it just comes off like boomer shit, like when your dad's trying to ask you to turn on the TV. Like, she just doesn't fucking get it. Somebody told her to say that. And I think she's just in tight with the intelligence community. And they're just, like, feeding her bullshit to say. Well, and I think so, too. But what I thought was funny is, like, the only thing that united women right now uh, was this idea that we need to start, you know, monitoring people online. I know this doesn't surprise people anymore. But uh, Kathy Hochul, like I mentioned, from uh, New York, basically mirrored the same thing, that we need to have the social yeah. media analysis unit. And I think it's so funny that the only thing that can unite Democrats and Republicans is Israel spending our money and censorship, right? And that's literally what it is. It's like, they agree we need to censor more people, we need to spend more of our money, and we need to send more money. I shouldn't say just Israel. That's not even fair. We need to send more money to foreign countries to fight wars that don't involve us. That's more of a fair right. statement, right? Israel's just the current one, because we just got done with Ukraine. I mean, we're still there, but you know, we're, we're still in Iraq technically and we're still actually technically in afghanistan and we're still technically in syria and libya and yemen okay it doesn't matter we're still everywhere okay it doesn't we're everywhere technically yeah you just saw yesterday they were like oh the u.s is getting bombed in syria like you forgot you thought we were out of syria no we're not uh can i just say one everywhere. thing before you play this can i say one yeah. thing before you play this I, this just occurred to me as we were talking about this because obviously i've been thinking about the story all day <laughs> Does that mean that like everybody with an OnlyFans account or a Pornhub account is gonna have to come out with their real name? Like, are we gonna know everybody's first and last name? We should get I'm like so screwed. the OnlyFans girls. They're like, fuck no, I can't tell my fans my real name. Dude, <laughs> there's gonna be so many uh, Baptist pastors committing suicide. I don't know if you saw that. It's really sad, but that guy, that guy killed himself because he was like, he was a curvy trans woman online, yeah, right? Suicide, bro. He killed both his identities. <laughs> Yeah. Oh shit, dude. That's so sad. That's so sad. I'm so sad. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And when a they them kills himself, is that a triple homicide? That's that's the dude, question. Dude, huh? it's, a, it's a mass shooting. One ball. Dude, that's so. 
<laughs> trans when it dude there was multiple shooters at the scene he went by they them oh it's so fucked up okay but but um i love you, I love you dude uh, i love you yeah, this is so good. Oh, shit. All right, listen to this. We'll play this for a second. This is a Kathy Hochul, governor of... Uh... By the way, I want to know in the chat, because I don't know what to do with this show, meaning it's been many things. I just switched software. Did you guys, would you guys rather have like more episodes like on a daily basis, just going over what's going on in the day? Or would you rather just have like one show a week talking about random stuff? I don't know what you guys want. I can do whatever I want. I run my own company and I can make whatever I want. Um, it really just matters what you guys want and what you guys want to do because uh, I can find sponsors. I can make things happen financially. I just need to know what you want and if you guys would tune in daily because uh, this because sometimes the news is good like today and it's interesting, but other days it's just – you know what I'm talking about even at InfoWars? It's more like how long of a show you want to go for because for me it's like I could do a show every day as long as it only has to be 30 minutes, but when you've got to go for like two to three hours and it's a bad news cycle, that's not You're fun. Or, yeah, so I feel like I'd rather not take up air. But this woman right here, Kathy Hochul, literally agrees with Nikki Haley. Focused on the data we're collecting from surveillance efforts. What's being said on social media platforms. And we have launched an effort to be able to counter some of the negativity and reach out to people when we see hate speech being spoken about on, on online platforms. Our media analysis our social media analysis unit has ramped up its monitoring of sites to catch incitement to violence, direct threats to others. And all this is in response to our desire, our strong commitment to ensure that not only do New Yorkers be safe, but they also feel safe because personal security is about everything for them. As I said, no one walking down the street or in a subway should feel they have to find to hide any indications of what their religious beliefs are. We expect to see people celebrating their lives, walking about freely, and that is no longer the case because people are living in fear. Is it Botox of why they all look like this? Is that Botox? Why do they all look like they all look like they're really serious all the time? Is that Botox? I don't know. I just think it's like a product of just teleprompter speaking for years and years to where your soul just sort of evaporates. <laughs> you know, maybe yeah. like the closer you get to Satan, the stiffer your whole body becomes. Like Joe Biden sort of just like amorphous, like can't really move. <laughs> and you even, I even saw him like take out a new piece today when he was sitting next to, um, what was it, Blinken at the, the Xi Jinping meeting with his boss. And he'd take out his earpiece and like he didn't even like move any of his fingers independently. Like it was just like this claw thing and he just like set it down. It's like this dude doesn't even have like dexterity of his like appendages. Like he's just gone. Like his his life force is like shrinking into his core, and it's like left the the appendages of his body, and like eventually it's just gonna like simmer away. <laughs> you do you do notice that because it's like even here, like I have to I have to fix my camera. It's all blue today and like kind of flat because I had to load some LUTs into it. It's really hard to run a studio by yourself. Uh, genuinely, I'm just here, you know, build this stuff by myself, hang out. But I also don't want to put too much money and time into this stuff because I don't know how long I'm going to be here. But I will say that, you know, one thing that I'm happy about now is I used to do a lot of teleprompter reading for different things. And I'm happy I don't do it anymore because I don't want to I don't like to say pre-recorded thoughts like and I don't and I don't think, you know, teleprompters are bad, for instance, like especially if you're not briefed on an issue as a politician or even if you want to do a monologue. Like if you want to sit down yeah, and write Tucker down a five minute. Tucker did it yeah. right when he was doing the monologue. At five. Right. So, so, so you want to do at the beginning of the show, you want to really be like eloquent so people can clip you and you want to make it a good, a good, you know, 15 minute, 10 minute, whatever it is, just so you can really get your thoughts out. But these people don't ever speak off the top of their mind. My favorite clip ever was when, um, uh, Rhonda Santis, uh, he tried to do a Trump moment where he was like, turn the teleprompters off and they removed the teleprompters. And then he proceeded to read off of a script on his, on his lectern. And I was like, like, dude, the, the it, I don't think we really care. I don't think people care if the words are on a teleprompter or on a piece of paper. You've just made your life hard, more difficult for no reason. They're talking about, like, just try to be unscripted. But he was still yeah. scripted, like, just kept looking down and reading a script. People just aren't real today. And that's what I'm saying mm -hmm. is, like, 
they're not real. And that's why you got to be really weary of people who pre-record their videos as well on YouTube and on the internet. Um, because oftentimes when they get into live environments, they're not, they're not very thoughtful and they don't really know what they're doing. And that's not to say, that's not to say that they're not actually intelligent and maybe their personalities don't allow them to thrive in this in this format. But what it means is that you don't know if they're really speaking their thoughts or not, right? When people get on camera and they're not the same way they are pre-recorded, you're going, well, yeah. who's really pushing yeah. you to say what you're who saying? Wrote it? Who wrote it, right? It could be chat GPT. So, so who are you then? If, if when I speak to you live, you don't sound like you are pre-recorded. And that's what I feel like politicians are. It's like, it's like, dude, you, if everything's a script, then who the hell are you? And it reminds you, you're being not, you're not being run by people. You're being run by a bureaucracy. Have you seen that uh, that footage of Bill Clinton preparing to give a speech from the Oval Office and they can't find the teleprompter? No, I never did. I'll have to send it. I'll have to send it to you as a DM, maybe after the show today, because I think it's I, to me it's one of the most fascinating little like ninety second or three minute clips of Bill Clinton ever. Because despite what we think of the guy, he was probably morally atrocious. I imagine that he was. I believe the likes of Juanita Broderick and people like that. But he was brilliant. He was a Rhodes Scholar. He was a brilliant statesman. Similar to I actually think Barack Obama was brilliant at the politician bullshit, even though I think he was a bad guy. And he doesn't have this teleprompter. He's got to give a live speech on television because of some bombings that happened. I can't remember the details. And he is just the, the makeup ladies all over him. He's like, where's the teleprompter? And he's reading the speech. And you can tell that he is just like memorizing the speech because he doesn't know whether or not the teleprompter is going to be there. And he's got it. Like it was just such a pro sort of magical moment. And it's just indicative of a different era of politics in this country where the politicians, whether they were good people or bad people, were all great politicians. Now we just have a bunch of shitty people that aren't even good at the politics anymore. Like they just brazenly lie or you catch them in a lie and they just don't care. And they say next question, like Green and GP are up there. Just like, I, I'm not going to say any more about that. It's just like, yeah, you caught me next. You know, it's like they don't, they don't even politic anymore. At least, at least the likes of Cicero and, the, and these old politicians that we had in, in America, they were suave about the way that they screwed us over. But now we're just getting fucked. And they're not even leaving a tip. No, you're right. Well, they are getting the tip, though. Some of them yeah. are getting the shaft. They're all they're shafting us. I really do. I yeah. They don't. They don't even try to make it seem like we have a semblance of a country anymore. It's like right. we're being run by like bartenders and Muslims, and it's just like and white people who don't care about white people. Uh, they'll fight for everything else except for their own country. It is quite bizarre. I bring up something quite funny though. Um, by the way, kudos to Charlie Kirk for defending Candace Owens in Christianity. It is nice to see somebody who is a staunch Zionist at least, um, you know, come in defense of Christianity ahead of Zionism. But I want to bring up something that I thought was interesting outside of this weird control uh, was – where is this? Ah, yes. You said like we've lack we lack a semblance of a country. You know, it's like they don't even try. I've been watching a lot of uh, videos showing um, – showing the construction projects in Africa in like black countries. And it sort of just reminds me of what happens when you're like have, I feel like we are a black country. I feel like we're a black nation. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, a lot of these African countries were sort of like handed a modern civilized society in certain large cities during their independence from F French colonialists, from British colonialists, from Spanish colonialists, Portuguese, etc. cetera. Um, and they didn't really know what to do with it. Right. Um, and so they ended up, you know, getting mad like in South Africa or in Rhodesia uh, about, you know, this, this separation of white and black. And then they got that taken down and then they ended up sort of just destroying, you know, now we have Zimbabwe and we have um, whatever South Africa stand is, you know, now crazy place. And there's nothing that reminds me more of like what happens where, you know, now you have these people who have a society, uh, but they don't really have the responsibility or respect to, to handle it and to manage it and to improve it. And I know we laugh at that, at the way they've ruined their countries, but I feel like we're doing the same thing in the United States. Right? I happen to believe it's the same thing. It's like the country is in the hands of people who don't understand or respect what they were given and that it's falling apart. And I see videos like this at a uh, bridge cutting ceremony in Africa. Uh, they, you know, everyone came to stand on the bridge to cut the ribbon, and here's what happened. Oh shit! I know what's gonna happen. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Build back better, bro. Build black better. <laughs> Doesn't that feel like what's happening in our country today? I feel like that Dude. is it's like we're it's collapsing before we can even start. Ribbon, it's like it's like tainted, man. That's some voodoo shit right there. I know. It's like that's 
Oh, man, but I mean, the bridge collapsed right under their own weight, and I think that's and literally it was like, just what our bridge nation is only is. like twenty feet long, dude. That's like a bridge over a creek. I'm not even sure if that's yeah. I guess that is a probably it probably floods or something during the winter. It's probably <laughs> that would have been taken out. I mean, look at that. Look at the concrete job too. I mean, can we talk about that? Like, look at the lining. I'm not even a uh, a trading. You got hire a union, man. You got to hire a union. That's what at, Biden look said. Look at that. Wait, yeah, wait. Look at that. Oh my gosh, that's that's not good. That's dude. that is not. That's not even the only one I have too. I have more. I have more videos looking at African construction, uh, and I don't. Someone troll was. I don't know if they were trolling me and said that that some of these videos I was sharing weren't from Africa, but um, I feel like I feel like they they are. Well, I feel like they were. Let me see if I can bring this up. Um, where is this? Sometimes I just post too much, and I think the videos are higher up, but they're not. Choo, 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 choo. Oh. That is also a weird question. Okay, shoot, man. Well, I think you know, I think you made a good point about how you know when, when people have something given to them, they don't take advantage. Of it. They don't appreciate it, and we see this with people who win the lottery, right? Like I don't know what percentage it is, but I think it's the majority of people who win the lottery. Many of them wind up either broke or bankrupt within like thirty six months on average. It's the right. problem with universal basic income. It's if you just hand stuff to people, they don't, they don't appreciate it. And it's just human nature. I mean. it's I guess it's indicative of character, but that's that's the difference between people who actually build something to people who inherit something. It's the reason I think that our nation building has failed in large, like Iraq and Afghanistan, places like that. We go over there, we tear everything down that they had, then we build a system that they're not familiar with, and we expect them to uphold it. But then as soon as we leave, everything's back to the way it sort of was before, even worse, before right away. It's sort of like a wasteful moot gesture that we even do it in the first place. And so I, don't, I wish our politicians would learn from that and just realize that, you know, if we just give it away. It's not going to work. But of course, for them, it's not even about that. They just like these government contracts because they're all invested in the businesses that get the tax dollars to provide these types of services. A hundred percent. Like, look at this. There's a lot of these. Someone said this was Akron, Ohio, but I think this is actually Africa. Uh, I don't think it might even be South look, Africa. Look what Someone Israel did to Gaza. Me. Look what Israel did look at this. to Gaza. <laughs> Watch this. I don't know what's going on here. Dude, you got to dig a hole sometimes. I don't chase. What is going on there? That is like, there's a lot. I have more of these videos, but it's like, it's just like government. That's just government. Do one more. Do one more. Humor me. Do one more. It's too good. I do love these. I'm, I'm really not trying to tell you what to do on your show. I'm no, sorry. I'm, I'm I am fine. No, you dude, You're not telling me what to do. I, I love this. That's not even. Um, that's not even the worst part about it. Let me see if you give me one second to find this other I'm video sure here. Time, I didn't, I didn't save night. it. We got oh, yeah, here Twitter you go. Page, so it's just African construction. I think this is a, I think this is a, uh, I think this is uh, South Africa as well. Fixing a muddle, a mud pothole. Watch. This is literally the video. Here we go. Guys, I don't mean to be uh, nasty in any way at all, but surely. <laughs> Surely, this can only happen in Africa, mainly South Africa. They now employ people, and with puddles like this, I can assure you, all this water here, it's like an ocean. Have a look at that. Up, down, all over the show. These ladies stand here all day, then they take the bucket, it's like when Trump tried to throw, it they throw it in the bay, feed the fish. Okay, 20 liters. Then they go all the way back there. Then they go all the way back while they're standing there having a con flap. They fill the bucket. Watch. Africa. It's probably about 400, maybe, maybe, maybe 150 mils of water at a time. Look at that. Then you have all this water here. Look here. It's all got to be done. Right there. And then it drains again and fills up the puddles. And then they start again. Uh, <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That is insane, Isn't that... man. That's some corrupt, corrupt like mafia stuff. Like, hey, they're probably getting paid a thousand dollars an hour to do that. They get kicked back up the up the stream. Dude, it's like 
but like that's what's going on in our country. And I and mean that like it's it's obviously a little bit more exemplified because people here still have some respect or like we still have some work ethic still ingrained that right. people people do work hard in the United States, right? Like one thing people don't understand about different countries is the people that live in the US oftentimes assume all Western countries are kind of the same, but they're really not. Like an example is in Australia, things really don't work well here. And people don't question that. Like they have internet from like 1952 and the government, you know, spends $40 billion on Aboriginal uh, programs, which I think is not enough, right? It's not enough. $40 billion. There's 25 million people in this country. We need more than a billion dollars per million people spent on Aboriginal, you know, we need to get them. We need to, we need to build entire cities that are fueled by Jim Bean whiskey you know what i mean like that's what we need in this country so i'm really into that i like aboriginals i feel like we should give them all of our money however it is crazy that like you know they spend 32 billion dollars on universal health care australia has one of the best universal health care systems in the entire world um and that only costs 32 billion dollars to ensure everyone in this nation uh which is like 25 million people and then a small minority gets 40 billion for who knows what, right? And that's like, and no one questions that. And then the country says, well, we spent a few billion dollars upgrading infrastructure. The freeways have traffic here. They're falling apart. They're, the internet uses copper wires. They don't even use proper fiber. There's barely any cell service anywhere. There's like 5G in a few places. Most places are 3G. There's entire portions while you're driving where there's no cell service. They just haven't built infrastructure um, to give you cell service between connecting between the cities. And um, and the service out here is horrible, like in terms of from people. Like people just are really like they just they don't, and they don't want to work. No one wants to come to work and people just want to hang out. And yet this is one of the richest countries in the world. Uh, second highest house prices in the world, second richest city in the world. And out of like the top 20 richest cities, there's only like five major cities in this country and four of them are in the top 20 in the world. And it's insane. And like, but it's like the only reason why is because this country is definitely on the decline, culturally, socially, everything. And it's the same reason because they inherited a wonderful country. They had a white Australia policy. They were one of the last apartheid countries in, in the world. They literally were... They just believe the only European hybrid stock should come to this country. They had high ethics. And then when they did change immigration, it was some individuals from certain Asian cultures. And then they started doing things that a lot of countries started doing, like just letting boats land and flood the country and letting Ethiopians come in and calling their own people a racist and, you know, starting to promote the trans stuff. And, you know, this country is way more liberal than the United States. I'll tell you that's a hyper progressive nation. It's a lot more wealthy than the United States per capita. People have a lot more money here. Um, and it's not a nicer, it's not a nicer experience of living. Yeah. You don't have like, black people running around shooting people here that often yet, but it's still like, there's a shooting every day in Sydney almost, and it's not entirely safe. Um, and, and it's really damn expensive. I mean, it's, it's, it's to, it's to the point I bought a chicken nuggets and a chicken burger yesterday, just chicken nuggets and chicken burger and a bottle of water. Cause remember you have to pay for, for ketchup here too. They don't like give you free ketchup and shit like that. You got to pay for that. Um, it's like what 37 AUD, so maybe like 24, 25 bucks for just like some chicken nuggets and a chicken burger or whatever. Maybe that's what it is, 24 bucks. Um, and a water bottle. And it's like that's my point. Is like it shouldn't be like that, right? You shouldn't have to spend one million dollars for a shitty apartment. You shouldn't have to spend, you know, 24 bucks US on 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 food, but they were given a country that was great and it still has the wealth factor and stuff, but really we're kind of headed on a decline, and every nation is in a decline. And it's like, and I think I have this video. That's why I bring this up because I want to play this video. This country's cost of living has gone up so much that the government even recently today said like, hey, we're just not really going to help you guys with like the cost of living because we basically don't know what to do. So grocery stores, right? Because you, you can't fill up your bag with as much food for the same amount of money have gotten creative here starting this week. Um, let me see if I can uh, share this. This week, they have uh, changed the, the bags because the cost of, of groceries has gone up. Check this out. So check out this bunch. Don't they just know how to read the room, hey? We've got record profits. We're talking about the cost of living and everything going up. They've got industrial action going on. But they know the old trick. They know why us fellas like a girl with small hands and ladies. They know why your fella trims the hedges to make the trees look a little bit bigger. If we're all going to whinge about how few bags of groceries we get for our dollars these days, they're onto it.
Because I can make the bag small. The main uh, chain here just shrunk the size of their bags because because people aren't to, so you didn't notice you're not getting as much groceries. So now you're getting you're still getting a full bag of groceries for 150 bucks, but the bag is 30 percent smaller. Like that's the solutions in our country now is like just try to cover up the problem, right? And that's what I mean. It's scary to me because it makes me wonder how bad the problem is and how much we're not really seeing it because they're just covering it up and covering it up. And maybe it's a lot worse than we even know. And then one day it's just going to blow up. Yeah. Well, they certainly lie with statistics like that. That's a, <clears throat> a fortunate example because it's a physical example that you can literally measure and see. But we see the Biden administration do stuff like that all the time where they're like, hey, you know, unemployment is is record low. But then if you look in the data, you see that 1.5 million people aren't even in the workforce anymore. They used to be in the workforce. People have actually just given up on looking for a job so they're not counted as unemployed because they're hopeless. So they can lie with the data and try to make things look better or they neglect the fact that instead of under the Trump administration where you could work one good job and pay your bills, now you're working three shitty jobs to try to just make ends meet. So yeah, the unemployment's way down, but why is everybody like a waiter or an Uber driver now, <laughs> right? So it's just, we see the same stuff from governments and businesses all over the place. The, the establishment will always try to lie about how good things are in order to sustain or grow their power. And the opposition will always lie about how bad things are in order to try to take the power. That's just the way it is, man. But check this out. I mean, like, people are starting to wake up how bad it's getting. This is actually kind of funny. So we all know that things are getting bad and that people are wasting money and the corruption's there. But it is kind of funny to watch people in Australia, like, because Australians still have a pretty good sense of humor. Like, I feel like Americans don't know how to laugh. But Australians, like, they laugh a lot on TV here still. And it's not over, like, oh, you got a nose ring? Like, they still, like, say inappropriate jokes sometimes and, you know, make some innuendos. And they're not fully gone, like, America in terms of the humor. Um, but, like, there was a park that was remodeled for $2 million. Um, and I'm convinced they're just trying to make our lives hell and miserable. Like, check this out. This is from uh, the Today Show on uh, Channel 9. And uh, this is in Melbourne, southern uh, Southern Australia. This is one of the largest cities, uh, metropolitan areas, one of the most famous cities in the world, right? Very famous port. And um, they did a $2 million makeover of a local park. Check this out. Good morning to you. <laughs> Looks like fun. <laughs> well, Carl, there's nothing more fun than actually balancing on a $1 million balance beam because that's pretty much what this <laughs> The council. I'm just going to show you around the rest of Melbourne's saddest park, according to residents. And uh, over there, we have the solitary sad swing. And then just to the left of that, we have the monkey bars. But mm. that is it for the kids. Now, what is remarkable is we've got a before shot, the before shot of what the park looked like. Mm. Now, after a $2 million spruce up, this is what the Yarra City Council <laughs> has come up with. Now, it was way better before. Residents <laughs> haven't been thinking about this, and one resident said that when they complained to the council, they were told, don't worry about it. Your kid can play in one of the new garden beds uh, over there that has been installed. Good morning to you. <laughs> Looks like fun. <laughs> Dude, and that's but that's what awesome. I mean by the corruption, right? It's like they're like, oh, let's like let's just put two million dollars into redoing a park, and then they like remove the fun stuff. Yeah, and I heard turn she it actually into... went missing after this, right? She like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like how she did the report standing on the one million dollar balance. Beam. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but dude, they're making really everything worse. About it too, is that the park actually looked kind of fun before. I know it looked like, actually looked like a pretty decent. I mean, this place yeah. is nice, but it's falling apart like every Western country. And it's like, it's just like, you know, I mean, I mean, it's expensive and it's like, the, you know, people can't even afford to live in the city spending $2 million to rip out a perfectly good place set and put in a balance beam. Like, I mean, this is, but this is kind of what they've done with our country, right? I mean, if you get really, you know, esoteric about it, they've removed, they're removing what's good about our societies and they're just replacing it with this weird modernity that it's a sterile. Yeah. And it lacks yeah. hum it lacks the humanity. It lacks the experience. And we're all meant to be like kind to each other and use the correct pronouns, but yet like nobody's happy and we're all on antidepressants, right? And like it's like this: we're meant to have like a clean and nice park, and there's no drugs in the park. But it's what is this place? It looks like a looks like a cat, like a cat park. Right? <laughs> like it looks like a like if you I don't know I don't know what this is. Wow, insane. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Man. They need to start following some Australian pages.
Dude, Australia is great because it's like it's like one of the smallest Western countries that exists with like a major military and economy, right? And so like you can kind of like watch everything happen on steroids here. Like it's like you can kind of like see where the like Australia is a testing ground for like the WEF and stuff like that. So it's like really fun. But yet the people here are like, yeah, except the people here like like I mean, I was walking out of a church meeting the other day and fuck, dude, like. I don't know if people ever saw, um, go look it up, go look up, uh, social spiders here in, uh, in Australia. Um, the, uh, you can go look at some of these, uh, large spiders. Um, and there's like some spiders like to have orgies and stuff. And you'll just find like a club of like spiders, the size of your hands together, which is very, very interesting because they adapted and apparently they found their ways into like houses and they didn't like to be isolated. So then they, um, evolved into being coming social. So they all hang out in large groups. So imagine walking into a group of spiders, like this big, all on each other. It's really gross. Um, and you have to get used to out here. Just like trying not – like I watched this one video and it was like, you know when you go outside but you don't want to go take out the trash because you got to make sure you're not getting in front of, you know, like some sort of an orb weaver. But then you want to make sure that you're not stepping in a funnel – a Sydney funnel spider. But then you also don't want to touch the trash because there could be a huntsman on it. And then you're also like wondering like – and it's like, yeah, you know, I know that vibe where you just give up. Like I have a stick just to get to my my door. I have to like – people know this at Live Rule, but you have to like really knock shit down because believe me, I've had some experiences here. I told someone where there was three uh, three orb spiders. If you want to look up like the 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 orb spiders, they're, they're about as big as your hand, medium size, a lot bigger than that if they want to get bigger. But there was once across uh, by me the little walk path. Three had made their webs and they connected them. I don't know how they did it in the, the, geo, the physics, but three spiders probably spanning about seven or eight feet. So I didn't walk into it, thank God. I could see – they were that big that I could at least see them in the light. But sometimes there's, like, things that happen here with wildlife that I just go, huh, like, that is – I feel like that we should burn this place. You know what I mean? I feel like we should just, like, light it on fire. Because, like, I've never seen spiders work together to create a longer web to make more of the path. Imagine walking into that and having spiders wrap you. And, and then it's every like a metaphor going, for globalism. It's like they just connect <laughs> yeah. all these different sovereign nations together and you walk into it. You're like – <laughs> dude real fast i have one more i have one more construction video um okay. i don't i don't know where this is but might as well be africa of just like government doing its job let's go ahead and let's watch this this is a, a street this doesn't look like america to me but maybe i'm wrong um here this looks like an asian country so it's not africa but check this out this is a, a road <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, a car got wrecked. <laughs> because they need the African bucket guys. <laughs> end it there chase um well i mean we're gonna wrap it up uh there on that point but i feel like that is a little bit of an example of what's going on right i mean this is there's a lot going on every single day um but i feel like things are falling apart and we have to have good attitude i do like to leave i'm trying to leave this show now with like a good uh, uplifting message and this is a reminder that you know you really can't control the world and it beco becomes very defeating um and i saw a, a message yesterday where somebody said what is what like you know the people that are the happiest uh, the uninformed voters are just people who are trying to work, take care of their families, 
and make an honest living. And what has it benefited me by keeping up with current events? You know, um, I'm just miserable and upset and I'm no better off financially. And I thought about that, that comment long and hard, right? A lot of people do tune in and out of this show, Infowars and shows, and it's good. It's healthy sometimes to tune in and out depending on what stage of life you're in, right? Somebody could be in the hospital. It's not the time to be focused on current events. You need to be focused on your family. Uh, but why do you continue and why should you continue to be in that? Well, the people that knew when Jesus was coming were those that looked at the stars. They looked for the prophecy. The, the, the disciples that knew Jesus was the Messiah were the ones that were looking for him, that were eager. And there's this idea of understanding the times and being informed. But if you're letting being informed make you miserable and upset and tired and angry because you're trying to control the world, then you're, you're missing the point. Um, but if you realize that being aware of what's going on is so that you can be smart with your decisions, that you can try to, you know, you can try to at least um, look out for your family, that maybe, especially if you're a man, you can kind of take on the force of the world for your family. You can be aware of what they're teaching in schools. You know what's going on in the workplace. You can kind of see what's happening with the economy. You know where you might need to move your family. It's really important as a man, especially to kind of be aware of what you can know. You don't need to know everything, but also it's really important to know that if it is taxing you and wearing you down, which it does to me sometimes, it's a good sign that your focus and our, my focus is off, right? Because our focus should be on what we do have control over in terms of where our spiritual you know, border is up. And we have control over our speech. We have control over our flesh. And we need to be working on ourselves because sometimes we try so much to control the outside world that we neglect to control spiritually what we should be controlling, which is to align ourselves with God and his purpose for our lives. And so if you're feeling empty and you feel like you don't have a lot and you've been watching too much news, do an inventory and, you know, maybe sit down and pray, meditate a little bit, talk to God, write some things down, see areas you need to work on and put the focus on God and let God do the work in your life. Commit your life to God. You're powerless over many things in the world, but you can give your heart to God and he can give you energy and give you life so that you're not trying to control the world. You're just observing it and making decisions and having fun while the world goes to hell, but you're not. So that's always good. Chase, I'll give you the last word on all of this. What are your thoughts on what we went over? What are your thoughts on that spiritual idea of just making sure that we're we're how are focused on what's important in life so we don't lose our good attitude and we don't let it get to us? I'd love to to close out the show and then plug away on where people can find you and follow you. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be with you this evening. I think your show is really impressive and I had a lot of fun, which is something that I think we forget on the right often is how important it is to have fun and actually have a laugh it's really easy like you said to get weighted down with all the bad news it's always seemingly bad news things always seem to be getting worse even if they're not and one of the things that i've sort of come to believe is a sort of idiom of wisdom is that when things are good they're not as good as they seem and when they're bad they're not as bad as they seem and i think that you're right there's a lot of wisdom in focusing on the things that are within the sphere of our influence within the circle of our influence and as we focus on those things we can expand that circle of influence that we have. And then that's how we change the world. But we have to start with ourselves. We have to start with our own health, our own families, and then work our way out from there rather than trying to fix the world and then working our way back in. So I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. And I really do appreciate the, the metaphor or the analogy that you had with the Bible and how when these prophecies are fulfilled, when these key moments have happened throughout the scripture, it happens to and with and among men and women who were aware of what was going on. It's not just like the stuff befalls an ignorant person who's just minding their own business. It's as if these people really paid attention, studied, and committed to doing work in the time that they were in. There was a sense of urgency and they paid attention to what was going on. So I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. I really do appreciate you again having me. Make sure you guys visit infowars.com forward slash show. Check me out from 8 to 11 a.m. Central Time on the American Journal on InfoWars, which you can watch at band.video or InfoWars.com forward slash show. And visit InfoWarsStore.com. Purchase some of the great products there to help keep us on the air as we fight the globalists and fight to take this country back in this very important next 12 months before the election next year. Absolutely. And we will be doing, that's why I got to get my shit together in the next few months. I got to get ready for the election year. Uh, don't forget guys to support them at InfoWars. And also if you want the easiest way you can support this show directly is to get a membership at censored.tv. The link's in the description. It really helps if you're a regular listener of the show and you watch the show. Um, they've really come in and supported us so we don't have to put so many ads on the shows. They've come in and supported us so that, you know, if I need to get medical help or whatever, I can and I'm not like struggling and coming on here high as fucking, you know, rambling on this shit. Although this probably would have been the fun 
of shows ever. It's probably good for all of our safety and for the safety of the show not to go there. But also, they're here to support us through the uh, election season. So you got to go to Sensor TV. Use my promo code OFFENSIVE, O-F-F-E-N-S-I-V-E. It's 20% off right now. It's amazing. And I got good news for you guys on Locals. Um, they are going to do another membership drive. I'm going to send you guys an email with your special code uh, that at least can help you guys if you want to get one there. Also, don't forget as well, thank you to my shout out. I haven't been promoting this as much, but we've been going live here all the time. Of course, we're here in uh, in Locals. You can send super chats here at ElijahShaver.Locals.com. This is my community. And uh, if you join the community, it's our community. Um, one of you guys sent this that I'm not racist, but I do wear an octopus on my head, which I think is fantastic. Uh, you might wonder who this guy is. I'll explain to you in a second. He's new to the show. We have a lot Johnny. of people. So, uh, yeah, he is. Well, you'll hear who he is. Uh, <laughs> MJ also said there's nothing wrong with celebrating, respecting, being proud of Western culture. It's perfectly natural for white people to do that. We've been too tolerant of too many other cultures that come here that don't assimilate to our values and belief systems. That's the primary problem. Too much tolerance. And it is too much tolerance. Shout out to all you guys uh, who are here. Everyone's like, oh, what happened to baby Charlie? Trust me, we have. Like, I love this. The, I do not respect you. If you don't, I don't know if you were tracking that. They said octopuses are racist now. Um, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I get it. <laughs> so, so you guys want to know who this is, right? This is uh, so this is a this is a a refugee. So we have our diversity coalition, right? If some of you guys that know the show know that we have uh, many people. Many characters, many of which are still in um, Texas at my house, but you know we have Greta Downberg, right? I mean, this is so good. Oh. We have this is good, right? Greta Downberg. Um, I get it, <laughs> dude. Don't don't ask me why her hair's up in a ponytail and it's messed up, okay? But I'm just saying, when I put her down, we don't know what's going on. So I'm putting her down for a second, but we have Greta Downberg, right? And I can't get her to sit up straight, but this is Greta Downberg, and um, come on. She's just always going in. Um, but this, I saw this guy, and I, I realized this This looks like pretty much the people they want uh, coming into our countries, right? This is like a refugee. He looks like a refugee. He looks uh, confused. He looks and, like Lando um, Parisian's co-pilot in uh, Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> I think that's what he's supposed to be. <laughs> but his name is Ham, okay? His name is Ham, H-A-M. And his last name is Mass. So it's not to be confused with Hamas, the terrorist organization, which is H-A-M-A-S. His name is H-A-M-M-A-S. But he's also got a middle name too, which we'll probably invent later. But the reason why is because they want refugees to come in. And it's not so important to worry about minor details like Ham's name and what's going on because that's not important. The, perp the point is, is that he needs somewhere to go. And we welcome him with open arms um, I don't have my soundboard and stuff set up yet because we're here. So this is Ham, Ham the refugee. It's Hamas, uh, which is very important to, to make sure you keep the space there. Hamas, not Hamas, and not hummus like the uh, lovely snack that is good with pita chips. So we are pretty much there. Um, people, I, it's, my wife wanted me to call him hummus, but I think Ham is for short is better. So we're good. Um, and we appreciate it. So we're welcoming him to the show. He's part of the diversity coalition. He's our refugee. Uh, and we refugees are welcome here, right? It doesn't matter if you're part of a terrorist organization or not. We don't need to vet you. The border's open. You are welcome in our country. Shout out to uh, Chase. Guys, make sure you follow him in the uh, below. Thank you guys for joining today's episode of Nightly Offensive. I was really surprised how many people joined in tonight. I'm not going to lie. I really was because I've been gone. I've been only done a few shows in the last month. I've been gone. It's been really irregular. Something's been pre-recorded, and I didn't. You know, you guys don't get a lot of uh, um, notifications. Yeah, maybe in this show, I don't invite like, you know, as many like hot chicks, and we don't just fight, like scream into the microphone and stuff, and we don't do all that exciting stuff. But we do try to hit real topics mixed with comedy and uh, a dark sense and taste of humor that always has been. And you guys have been a loyal audience from the start. And I thank you guys um, for being with us as we try to make sure we don't get J6 and we have a good uh, time in the future. Anyways, Chase, thanks for coming on. And to the rest of you guys, have a great rest of the week. And uh, may God bless the United States of America.